technology can be disruptive in more places than just healthcare. So, uh, I want to thank the presenters that have come before because they've not only helped me set up my entire presentation, but I think they've also um, shown why I have a lot of job security. Um, sorry, I, have to, I also apologize for my notes. Um, quality measurement is such a big space, I can't do it all, unfortunately, as much as I like to think I do. Um, so my, my role at NCQA is really um, chief, dis chief disruption scientist. I'm actually really not a researcher in many ways. Um, I like to think that the observational research that I do as part of quality measurement um, is what quality measurement is all about, so it's really sort of watching what happens, um, and I think that needs to change. So, so I can get this to work. All right. So today I'll be talking a little bit about HEDIS, but I do, I do want to make one distinction between quality measures and quality measurement. Um, one of the reasons NCQA is a leader in the field is because we do quality measurement. We do both. Um, but quality measurement, I think, is what, again, what we've seen today, and this, it's a much broader area, and there's a lot going on there, and it really makes, um, it's challenging. Um, I'll be talking about a new standard we're developing at NCQA, um, along with everybody else so that's, that's sort of working in this field. And a, and a new way that we're doing things at NCQA. NCQA, like our federal partners, um, change is difficult and change is slow. And so a lot of these things have, are very recent. Um, some of these slides are actually already out of date and they were only done um, a couple months ago. So um, it's, you know, it's again trying to keep up. Um, and there's been a lot of change in how we think about quality measurement. And so a lot of what we're doing at NCQA now is while we're still trying to maintain the, the measures that are out there and the measurement programs that are out there, um, we're really trying to think way ahead um, and really think about you know, how we can change HEDIS, which is a, a great incentive to do things certain ways, whether it's for, you know, um, because you actually believe in the quality or because you're, there's extra money or other incentives attached to it. Um, but we think we can change that. And, and now with these new systems that are out there, um, are allowing NCQA to include in HEDIS uh, measures that we could not uh, do before. And so um, you know, things like care coordination and PROMS. Um, so this is the list of new measures for 2017 for HEDIS. Um, the 93 now needs to go to 97. Um, these were just approved, so you, you will see these coming up soon, but I wanted to have you guys, um, since you invited me, the, the um, uh, first look <laughs> at the new measures. Um, so, you know, really, again, we're, we're really trying to shift our focus to patient safety and coordination of care in the measurement space using the, the tools and the technology that we have right now and still thinking ahead to the future. Um, so the first two measures that we're looking at um, really look at uh, a very specific population in, under very specific circumstances. So we're looking at um, ED discharges um, or ED encounters for patients with MI or AOD. I'm sorry, I'm from Washington, I use a lot of acronyms. I apologize in advance. Um, you know, patients who don't receive appropriate follow-up for these specific conditions are, are six times more likely to have a readmission in the ED itself. And so it's, it's really trying to, again, get to that level of where we can understand, um, you know, what kind of follow-up care, what kind of care coordination are these patients getting to prevent those future readmissions. Um, and, and again, we're, we're, these are limiting in some way because we're looking for primary diagnosis um, for behavioral health conditions and the follow-up for that that kind of diagnosis. So it's not it's, they're not broad. They're not they're actually looking at a very specific swath of the population. Um, the denominator for both of these is, is an encounter-based visits. So we're looking at ED visits um, and not just individual members across the um, across the spectrum for the entire measurement year. Um, we do have some rules within the measures that that say you know if there's multiple visits within a very short period of time frame. I think we picked the last one in a 30-day period. Um, so again, trying to give time for follow-up to occur after an ED visit. So if you just have a whole series, um, you're just going to get noise in the data. You're not going to get a good, um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, both measures do, uh, don't include ED visits that result in an inpatient uh, transfer admission. So again, we're really just looking at, at the a discharge from an ED and a follow-up visit for appropriate, that's appropriate to the behavioral health care setting. Um, we do actually, and this is fairly new, we are including telehealth as numerator compliant visits for these measures. Um, there was a lot of conversation and controversy about you know, payers paying for telehealth services, but um, really, particularly in the behavioral health space, we feel that this is um, really an important, uh, we wanted to recognize the potential of telehealth, uh, particularly in the behavioral health space, and improving access to follow-up care. And again, um, when things end up in HEDIS, things tend to get done more often, um, whether, whichever way we want to look at that. 
Uh, the third measure, the second type of measure we have is, is, is something, it's like now for something completely different. Um, we, we really tried to, again, think in the patient safety context, and we've been tossing around, and, and David, uh, listening to the board meetings, may have heard some of the ideas that have been tossed around for some time about what is a patient safety measure in the heat environment. Um, you know, HAIs are a persistent problem. Uh, they have substantial impact on both health outcomes and cost. Um, right now, 70% of U.S. hospitals are reporting CLABS, ECAUTI, surgical site infections, MRSA, C. diff to CDC, um, you know, all the event data to CDC um, on a quarterly basis, I think. And so, you know, there's, there's some good data that's coming in um, for a purpose. And, and C CDC summarizes all of this and creates a, a standardized infection ratios um, for a facility, which is a risk-adjusted model based on observed number of, of events um, and then the expected number. Um, you know, based, adjusted for facility by the facility type and by the patient, uh, you know, makeup and um, a few other hospital characteristics. Um, this, this information appears on CMS's hospital compared, so it's publicly available data. Um, and, and really, you know, what we're trying to do with this is take that hospital data that's, that's available on hospital compare and create a measure that really assesses the risk of member exposure um, in the hospitals, uh, you know, under which the plans have contracts with. So. <clears throat> Again, we're, the, the plans now are going to be reporting a standardized infection ratio measure um, weighted by the proportion of total members discharged from hospitals um, that have reportable SIRs um, alongside a, a, a second indicator, which is going to basically uh, stratify the risk of those hospitals by high, medium, and low SIR. So we'll have a, a, a picture of you know, where the members are going. Um, and we're only going to do that for four infection types. Unfortunately, the SSIs were, uh, there, there's too low an end there for us to be able to do that, and that, there's not enough SSI data in the CDC hospital compared because they're not reportable um, due to low numbers. We think this really offers us a useful picture of the composition of a plan's network, particularly around patient safety. Um, you know, interventions are possible from plans. There's, there's ways that um, plans and hospitals can create relationships, payers and hospitals can create relationships um, to help reduce HAIs, and, and we think the, the attention focused on this, and even though it's other measures that were and publicly available data, um, you know, th this calculation, we think there is some, some utility. And, and this figure sort of illustrates a very simplified version of this weighting calculation where, um, you know, four hospitals that have planned members discharged um, are combined into a plan weighted SIR, um, which is then reported separately for each of those four infections. So we have four SIRs reported for, for this one payer, if you will. Um, um, and, and then the second indicator there would be classifying those indicators by where uh, those patients, which hospitals those patients were, whether they were classified as high, medium, and low risk, or whether actually also they were, uh, the SIRs were unavailable, so we're trying to encompass as many of the hospitals in the plans network as possible. Um, the, the classifications are based on upper and lower confidence intervals that will be calculated by NCQA for each state, so we're going to do a state-based confidence interval calculation, so all the hospitals will be defined by state um, to be classified for this. Um, and that was really a decision we made based on data availability um, and, um, again, standardization of, of trying to um, create um, a, a feasible, uh, useful model of opportunity to address patient safety concerns. Before I talk about our last measure, um, I'm going to break off here and, and talk about our efforts around what we're calling ECDS. Um, you know, as you've heard, uh, over the last 25 years, NCQA has really established a, a, set of, a series of requirements or standards um, for quality reporting um, that really by many is considered the gold standard. And, and what we're doing now is we're um, expanding on those standards, or we're introducing a new set of standards depending on what, how you look at this. Um, and we're affectionately calling it measures using electronic clinical data systems, or ECDS. Um, we're, we're measure developers, we're not all that innovative in our naming. Um, what are ECDS? So I think you're going to recognize what ECDS are, and really what EC, this, this whole new domain development and standards development is just a recognition of what's out there and what could be used for quality measurement, and especially um, as you heard from you know, the several presenters in front of us. Um, they're, they're databases, they're databases plural, they're not a singular database, I think, I'm hoping that David will um, appreciate this. Um, when combined together, can really provide a much more complete picture, they can provide a much better picture and a higher, they can, they can improve the quality of the data, um, you know, better than any single source on its own. So HEDIS has, has relied on claims for the past 20 years, because that was what available, that was what was standardized. Um, and, and it was, it, we could get reliable reporting from claims. Um, most of those measures were never designed for claims. We have uh, exclusions in them that were only there because they were from claims. Um, the best example is looking at 
um, polycystic ovary disease in the diabetes measures. That, that's not something you would see in a clinical measure, and it's not in the eCQM because the, the problem is, is you get into a diabetes denominator using medications, and <laughs> unfortunately, polycystic ovary disease is also treated with some of those medications, and so we wanted to make sure we weren't measuring. And, and those algorithms are, have been well refined, but they're kind of already out of date because we have better systems, we have better data. Um, you know, applicable eCDS, we've seen several today. I'm, I was interested to see Bo's presentation this morning. I think there's one right there. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're payment systems, they're EHRs, they're case management registries, they're, they're IIS systems, they're everything, as long as they meet certain criteria. Sort of, you know, the, the beginning of the list is what you see here. Um, you know, the Federal Health IT Strategic Plan says we need to use HIT to improve care, improve population health, and reduce costs, and we think that by um, helping develop the standard around reporting quality will will move the needle very far in the direction of increasing the timeliness and the relevance of the data used to report measures um, and will contribute heavily to that vision. Um, and our aim really is to, to, to create a new quality reporting system um, that can interchange and use electronic health information with really very little manual effort by those um, into the middleman or the, those in, in, you know, between the point of care and, and their provider. <coughs> Um, you know, again, we're, we're, we're using, the goal of introducing ECDS here is to use the HEDIS machine to sort of stimulate data sharing and interoperability in many ways. Um, we want to make sure, though, in this process that the information needed to provide high quality care is translated back to the people who need it and, and when, they, when it's most useful, when they need it the most. Um, you know, electronic clinical data shouldn't require a transformation at every level of accountability. Um, the current proliferation of measures, I think, is, as Bo's first slide showed, uh, is, is the result of tweaking. It's the result of tweaking measure logic. It's a result of tweaking accountability logic um, or algorithms to suit the needs of a particular program or a particular vision for people who are quality measure experts but may not be quality measurement experts. Um, and, and more often than not, they stray from the original intent of the measure in doing so. Um, just to, to give you a, a sample of, of the, the programs I think were shown in the earlier slide, um, you know, I've been in this measurement space for almost a decade. Um, the person who is in, who's the measurement uh, lead for the QRS program is in the office next to me. The person who is the measure lead for the EPECQM program is two offices down and reports to me. Um, so these measures are all over the place, and, and the parent measure that may have been from HEDIS or from wherever else it was, I mean, I was the person responsible, don't throw fruit, um, for that first transition to Meaningful Use 1 from HEDIS, and, and the, the 33 of those measures um, were a very interesting experience, and I am a measurement expert because of all my spectacular failures of the past, and I've learned so much from them, and I try and move forward. <clears throat> um, but, you know, using quality to create a framework that encourages access to data for both those providing services and those who need it to report quality um, <clears throat> require, a, you know, some data validation, and, and we want to maintain the veracity of the data, so we need those federally what are we calling them now? They're, they're, they're federally recognized data standards. Um, and, the, and the feds have been a great help in this environment by really saying, you know, these are the preferred data standards that we really want to um, op operationalize, we want consensus-based, we want transparency. Um, and so NCQA is really incorporating um, these data standards into their new specifications, particularly under the ECDS space, um, to really help reduce the measure versioning. So we no longer need a, a measure stack that includes the value sets in the bottom, the measure calculation algorithm for the clinical data in the middle, the attribution la layer on top of that, and then the public reporting layer on top of that, that, that is, you know, just requires a whole bunch of different versions to be created. And, and we think that by, by doing this, um, we're gonna really advance not only standardization of clinical communications, but also um, you know, the accuracy and timeliness and its results because you're, the providers are not gonna be worried about which measure to report. Um, I, I'd like to be a little heretical here myself with, with a caveat. Um, I do think we need more measures. Um, I really do, and that's not just to promote my own job security, but I think there are, there's a whole opportunity out there um, for new measures. I also don't ever want providers to report measures ever again. Um, I don't think that's, that's who should be doing it, um, honestly. And, and, and if we could do that tomorrow, I would be a very happy man and I would retire. Um, so this is, this is an old diagram. Um, I think, you know, many of what you should substitute for that health plan master index are things like My Health Network, um, like the, the Michigan, I'm sorry, I can't remember the name of the MCRMN or whatever. Um, basically, it's, it's, that, it's that source that is collecting data from different sources and then providing it back to the reference systems that need it, whether it's the point of care, whether it's community sources like the IAS. Um, and I think it, it's critical to not exclude claims from those processes. I think they're, they're a great indicator of, of data of validation. 
Um, and you'll notice the bi-directional arrows in this. I mean, that really is what we're trying to do with ECDS, is, is the bi-directional communications, excuse me, for HEDIS reporting or for PQRS reporting or for meaningful use reporting. And I think that there's, you know, it is. It's one, it's one, data, one data extract to report to multiple places, and I think there are people who should be doing that. Um, and I don't think it's the providers. Um, you know, so as these, these effective, effective data systems really sort of start capturing more and more data, more about the patient experience, um, we really have to sort of continue to encourage a movement of quality measures integrated as opportunity CDS tools, really um, evolving to a point where a big data quality measure will just seamlessly suggest enhancement to a care plan or, or will identify pre-disease markers and patterns of the data that, that wouldn't be um, noticeable by a, by a human, um, you know, who just sort of sees data, and I think this gets to the the idea that you know humans are the, the data can you know do a pretty good job of predicting things, um, and we just need we need to use it, but it needs to be a decision support. It should not be something that that over overreaches or should not um, dictate care. Um, so the other new thing that we're doing is is we're really engaging our stakeholders much more in the development phase of things, and so to do we. Uh, in order to do this ECDS uh, standards development, we've convened a, a collaborative, and this has really been a very interesting process for us, um, where the collaborative really just helps us understand how this would work, and, and we um, convene 13 plans um, to help us write the standard for bi-directional information sharing for the purposes of reporting to HEDIS. Um, you know, so, so once we sort of outlined the, the principles and vision of what we wanted to do, we, we put out a call for volunteers and, and a number of plans volunteered and we selected a, a, a group that, you know, has had variation in plan size and geography and um, <clears throat> number, different types of ECDS systems that they had and, and we tried to ask them about a, a minimum threshold of people who might be in that so we could sort of understand what, you know, who we'd be talking about and, and have enough data to actually do some analysis. And um, they attended monthly calls, we had a lot of technical assistance, uh, we have a website. Um, you know, and, and really it was a very interesting way. And so we discussed the guidance, we discussed the new measures that were coming up. We also discussed a piece of the new measures that were sort of baked in. We have a structural measure baked into these new measures. Um, it's called ECDS coverage rate. And really what that is is a, a way for NCQA. It's not a quality measure report. It's a way for NCQA to understand who is in that initial population based on, you know, who's covered by these systems. And it's not, you know, we want to know the proportions and that's just for us to be able to calibrate. Um, it'll never be something that's reported in, in, in Quality Compass or publicly. It's just something that we needed to, you know, because it's such a different space for us, we needed to know that. Um, it's really been wildly successful. Um, we've, we've learned so much, I think, both from the, on the plan side and also on NCQA side about how to do this and how to do it in an agile, quick fashion. So our normal measure development cycle or our normal standards development cycle is, is a multi-year process and um, most of this has happened within the last 12 months. And so for the HEDIS 2017, what you'll see in that book is the result of much of that. So now onto the last measure that's new for HEDIS 2017, um, the depression remission and response for adolescents and adults, and this is an outcome measure. Um, I, like th I like to think of this as a real outcome measure in many ways. Um, it's the second in the set of the three that we, we've been working with the Learning Collaborative to report. The, the first one um, appeared in HEDIS 2016. Um, you know, depression is the second leading cause of disability worldwide, and, and there's effective treatments for it. And, and patients who are monitored, you know, who are identified, first of all, and then who undergo a active collaborative management of the condition really, you know, uh, improve their health, um, and, and outcomes are critical to depression measures. Um, however, several of those variables that we needed are not um, in admin claims. Um, and so this was, these were the, the ideal pilots for us to, to sort of think about how we could use ECDS to report these measures. Um, and the, you know, the plans, the learning collaborative plans have the option of selecting any of the three to report. Um, in IDSS right now, you can report the, the um, utilization of PHQ-9 measure. Um, and so, but to date, we've already received from our learning collaborative plans, um, from five of them out of the 13, we've received the measure results for these, including the ECDS coverage rate and the, and the measure results for um, depression remission response. So it, like I said, it's been wildly successful from my perspective. Um, we know from our testing experience, we, we, these measures themselves were derived from the Minnesota Community Measures, uh, the provider level measures that, were, that are used by Minnesota Community Measures and are the E-Measure versions. Um, so sorry, there are a few more versions, but we, again, tried to remove the, from the data element level, there, there are not, there, they're as close to those principles as possible. Um, but we know there's a quality gap that exists, both from those measures and from ours already. Um, and, and there's a lack of follow-up for those who have an initial PHQ score, so elevated PHQ score. So, you know, again, we, we need to sort of think about outcomes, we need to think about outcome measurements, and, and this, this measure has multiple numerators to, to sort of track those different outcomes from these patients over a longer period of time, um, still in the sort of HEDIS format of the measurement year, but again, moving towards really getting at measurement of outcomes. Um, 
it's really important for us to think about you know, the collaborative care model for depression and how HEDIS measures might encourage that. And, and we really are thinking that ECDS is one of the solutions, not the solution. Um, but it really is going to be, you know, it's really instructive to us and we now, now have much more collaborations and we, we see this as the new way moving forward to develop measures and to develop HEDIS measures and to get, and to get HEDIS um, up to date. So encouraging effective use of ECDS, you know, using those nationally recognized data standards is really going to reduce the reporting burden. Um, we are working right now to figure out how we can delete all of our hybrid measures from HEDIS by um, expressing them in CQL. It's, it's exciting, it's new, it's scary, um, but we think it's the future. And, and again, as we transition from meaningful use to MIPS, um, you know, quality measurement also has to evolve from a supportive role uh, into a supportive role from a punitive one. I mean, we really have to sort of move away from the check boxes and the, and the accountability aspects and really kind of use them to give us a prospective account, uh, um, accounting of events in order to sort of offer opportunity before it becomes a problem or before these patients, it's just too late for the for them information to be meaningful at all. Um, and so we've been changing the focus. Um, you know, the incorporating social networking data and personal health record information are hopefully going to fill some of these information gaps. Um, but in integration of those, you know, these, these vast data sources that are new and outside the healthcare system prevents some really interesting challenges to maintaining data integrity. And I, I like to think of it as sort of, you know, where a river of clinical data meets the ocean of social networking data, it creates a whole new amalgamated ecosystem, aka a brackish, muckish, muddy mess, um, that, that imposes a whole new evolutionary pressure to, to succeed. And so in, if you can succeed, and if you can prove that you can succeed in here, you will succeed. And I think there's been great, um, and the only way to do this is through cooperation. And so I think there's been some great efforts recently to, to sort of understand that and figure it out. Um, it also prevents some fascinating opportunities to really disrupt the quality measurement space, which is where I come in. Um, you know, I've been working to, to get away from individual process measures and really think about um, using predictive analytics, um, using big data to develop a quality measure that will help just radically shift um, the measure. So coming soon, hopefully, there will be one new measure in HEDIS that will supplant 18 of them. Um, and I won't tell you when that's going to happen because I don't know yet, but um, I, I, you know, I remain optimistic. Um, but again, you know, big data solutions to get there require, you know, interoperability and they require these, these, these really innovative efforts to understand what data we can get, how we can use it, what we need. Um, we want to remove the human factor from the equation, from the calculation equation, not from the quality measure focus. And this is where I want to get providers out of the um, quality measure reporting business and I want to get them into thinking, of, you know, in, reintroducing the humanization and the human factor back into the quality aspect and let the, let the engineers, let the data scientists worry about the, the amalgamation of that data and how it can be used and how it can be effectively shared and how it comes back to them in a way that it fits in with their clinical logic and the way they've been trained or the way they think about how they should even visualize these displays. Um, so, you know, the, the predictive medicine, precision medicine, predictive analytics can tell us a lot about people. People are really actually pretty predictable, sadly enough. Um, and my work in risk, and, or risk adjustment and analytics has really told me that. Um, you know, matching data across multiple sources um, requires sophisticated systems. Um, the, the measures must be sensitive to the individual patient. So the, again, the humanization of, this, of the measurement of quality, um, it's got to account for the individual circumstance. So everything I think we've heard before and some of the questions we've heard about, you know, well, well what do I do as a provider with this information? Um, we need the big data to make these clinically relevant. Um, in the measurement space, we, we, need to, we need to aggregate those elements um, that all interact with each other to inform that person's disease. At the same time, they sort of also inform the person's risk um, for the future. And so by, by, by creating these measures that look at and, and evaluate the nuanced relationships within this ensemble um, is, is the future of measurement. And, and it really is where the prediction accuracy and where the relevance is going to really come to, to to bear and, and sort of instead of the, you know, segregating each biometric and clinical process into its unique little reporting units, this idea of a global unit or a global measurement or a whole person focused approach is, is going to increase the relevance, I mean, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, I mean, you name it. And clinicians who are armed with this kind of information can really make, um, take advantage of that and they can really, you know, basically focus on the unique situation of their patients or their own practice or their characteristics of, their, of the environment they work in and, and reward, be rewarded for successes. Um, but while still focusing on the individual patient. And, and so this is where the GCVR comes in. This is one of the projects I've been working on for a long time. Um, it, it's a predictive analytics measure. It uses a large number of variables to, to describe a, a 
practices population's risk of cardiovascular events. And we've actually expanded the model into pulmonary now, but this is right now what we've done is CV. Um, <clears throat> the quality opportunity here, though, is really actually in tracking the progression of scores over time, not the absolute value of the scores themselves. So again, shifting the whole idea of what quality measurement is. Um, and, and we're piloting new ideas about how to take those the, that progression of scores um, and what the clinically important differences are of those scores and how that translates at the, from the practice level measurement to the individual outcomes that were, are of most interest. And that's where we're still in that territory of trying to define what a measure actually is and what the measure will be. So, but ultimately, you know, this is the innovative multi-level quality measurement strategy that removes the provider from reporting the measure. It supports decision making at the provider level and helps facilitate those, those provider conversations um, with their patients about reducing risk. Um, you know, Less is more, though. I mean, so, so as we transition, it's going to be really challenging for us to, to um, promote these models that are reducing the amount of data available to feed the model. <laughs> um, so, you know, as a measure developer, we have to sort of think ahead as well to other outside data sources using social media and other things that to continue to sort of self-evaluate the model's performance because... Um, <clears throat> As these move to a preventive strategy, and as we're starting to apply these to the sort of apparently healthy population, um, there's two things that can happen. We're not going to have enough data to actually run the models anymore because they do they do require a, a lot of data. I mean, and a lot being a lot more than we were used to working with, um, <clears throat> and they take some time to do. But you know, again, we still have to sort of think about first, do no harm. So are we going to drive people to uh, you know engage in, in non-traditional partners out there in the healthcare field, and, and how is that going to happen? And I have no idea, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to trying to figure that out. Um, let's see here. So, so our future um, is not with predictive quality measures is not really all unicorns and rainbows, I'm sorry to say. Um, the precision medicine approach to early identification of risk using machine learning really presents new questions on how we're going to define high quality care. Um, we really have to still unscramble this puzzle of, of our shifting focus. Um, quality is becoming the new framework for how clinicians are being paid for their services. And so, you know, while a shift to a predictive preventive approach removes the perverse incentives that are currently in the quality measurement system, um, it really does challenge us to sort of define as a measure developer sort of, you know, how people do just enough of the right thing, but not any more than that, because there's a very fine line there between what you're know, doing just enough and then and, and going over. Um, and, and where this is relevant is, you know, these deep learning AI applications that we're using are really effective at detecting risk and patterns of risk and really could theoretically push us into a, an overuse situation very quickly. But they can also shove us well away from that. They can put the, the information in the hands of the people who, can, who are best, um, best, uh, you know, best able to manage it. And so in an era with, with a close attention of value and cost in, in the healthcare field, um, you know, as we move into these really cool new models, um, it's, it's really important for us to sort of think about what is our real true aim and, and what our mission for improving quality and what that really is. So thank you very much and I'll take questions. I'll be here for lunch too if you want to sideline me somewhere else. That's <laughs> Thank you. I was thrilled to see that there will be a measure added for follow-up after an ED visit for alcohol or other drug use. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on um, the difficulties that we have had with that type of follow-up care because of 42 CFR, and I know that there were uh, potential revisions coming to that, um, but just wondering what your take is on that. I can give you as much information as I can based on the fact that I was not actually the PI on that measure. I, I had to include that because it was one of my other. But, um, you know, again, I think this is, a, this is it's, an, it's a claims based measure. We're trying to still use some of the old ideas of what we can interpret from what happens using the payment systems to define um, good quality care and to sort of stimulate, I think, this measure in the future, um, really doing a better job of, of really tracking that follow up care and finding that meaningful follow up care. So I, I don't really have an answer to your question, but I think the the idea is that this is, this is a, a one way to break the ice on that, and it is really restricted to a, to a behavioral health population, and there's a whole bunch of other data issues in that population with carve-outs and everything else in the, in the payment benefits. But, um, you know, again, in, in, in NCQA's shift to really focusing on those critical measures that address those special populations and new way of doing things, we're still beholden to our old algorithms and, and ways of, of, you know, the data that we have access to and things we can measure, so. Yeah.
it, it's a federal regulation that um, limits the uh, or adds additional consent on top of the data shared by providers who put themselves as predominantly uh, performing um, addiction treatment services. That's the actual language. So the uh, limitation is actually very narrowly defined to addiction treatment providers and addiction treatment centers. Um, if you're not in that narrow definition, like you're a primary care doctor that does uh, uh, sees follow-up, or if you do a whole range of services and you don't predominantly do addiction treatment, you're not actually covered under 42 CFR Part 2. So there's a, a, lot, of, um, a, a lot of people with uh, a lot of fear around sharing data that actually can be shared because it actually isn't um, limited under the narrow definition of 42 CFR Part 2. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs>